Haslock Equipment and Markings. In this presentation, we're going to be looking at Haslock Electrical Equipment Markings, Haslock Electrical Equipment and Surface Temperature, and finally, Haslock Electrical Equipment and Closure Ratings. Electrical equipment installed in Haslock locations must not ignite the external gas, atmosphere, or the suspended dust in the atmosphere. Ignition could be in the form of a spark or high equipment surface temperatures. Here's an example of what could happen if we did not have Haslock rated equipment, a standard electrical switch, an explosive gas atmosphere, and a light. And here we come, we turn on the light switch, click, there is a small arc inside the light switch enclosure, which causes a very small ignition of gas inside the enclosure, which then ignites the entire surrounding area. And what a mess. To prevent ignition or explosion, one of the three sides of the fire triangle must be eliminated. Technology was limited in the early days of electrical haslock. This led to a simple and effective form of equipment that is still used today. Early Haslock equipment design methodology assumed that flammable gas would seep into the electrical enclosure, that the electrical comp components inside the enclosure would generate sparks, and that flammable gas would ignite inside the enclosure when the component was operated. So what they did, as they designed it to contain the initial force of the internal explosion and then provided controlled paths to release high pressure combustion gases out to the atmosphere. And this is where our explosion proof battleship technology came from. The premise is quite simple. We have machined flat surfaces with a very tiny gap. And the tiny gap allows for the forces of the internal explosion to seep out. And as they seep through here, they cool as they go from a high to a low pressure. It can either be a flat machined surface or it can be threaded entries or threaded caps. All of these are precision machined to re reduce the temperature of the combustion gas as it seeps out. If we look at an explosion proof electrical enclosure, the surface of the flange and the cover must be clean prior to closing. Every coverable must be fastened and tightened to the rated torque. You need to have a friend help you mount it. This junction box weighs approximately 85 pounds. And it's expensive. This junction box costs around $3,500 US. Finally, the surface of the flange on both the cover and enclosure cannot be damaged. Any scratches, gouges, dents, warping from dropping can all affect the design tolerances and render the enclosure unsafe for Haslock use. So we utilize an enclosure like this with a basic, silly, standard duty electrical device, like a light switch. Now with an explosion proof electrical switch, we can come along, operate the switch. There is a tiny explosion contained inside the box, but there is no external ignition of the atmosphere. Pre-1997, North America, Haslock equipment protects by containing explosion with thick metal enclosure. Haslock areas classified by class and division. Explosion proof was the only equipment available and we've already reviewed that it contained the explosion. Everywhere else in the world, Haslock equipment protects by containing or preventing explosions with technology. Haslock areas are classified by zones, and this is often referred to as IEC equipment. Now notice the phrasing here, this is explosion protected. And what we'll notice is that we're preventing the explosion from taking place to begin with. Typically, we have plastic enclosures and the explosion protectant methods with technology are all confined to the components within. Now, there are many ways that IEC or zone type Haslock equipment is designed to prevent atmosphere explosions. They do have the classic type of explosion proof, but they refer to it as flame proof. It does almost exactly the same thing. It's simply certified to a different level. It's also going to have a letter that identifies this method of protection. If we look at the upper right hand corner, EX indicates that it's explosion protected. D indicates 
flame proof. Oil immersion. O represents this method of protection. Sparking is submerged in a dielectric oil. Encapsulation, lowercase m. Powder fill, lowercase q. Increased safety, lowercase e. This one is used in all sorts of different apparatuses and really it's uh, replacing morets with good uh, tension providing wire binding terminals and special coatings on wire binding screws. Examples of some of these types of installations would be something like this. We also have pressurized, lowercase p. If we flood the area with an inert or normal uh, air that's not explosive, then there's no possibility of an explosion. Intrinsically safe, which is a full package deal with the type of component in the hazardous location and an electronic barrier that prevents the ignition of that atmosphere by reducing the energy in the circuit to a value below what is necessary to cause a spark. We'll look at this in more detail in a future presentation. And finally, non-sparking, lowercase n. Now, you don't have to memorize each one of these. Instead, if we remember that Appendix B exists, there are more details on each of these methods of protection. Having a general knowledge that these methods of protection are represented with a letter and that they would be present on equipment and represent a specific form of protection is really as far as we need to go. So in Canada and the US, we are allowed to install both IEC and the older division style equipment for HasLock installations. 18052 simply states that the location or the hazardous location, the equipment installed in the hazardous location must have markings suitable for the zone in which the equipment is installed. Haslock equipment markings can be shown on nameplates in three different forms. Class and division markings, EPL or equipment protection level markings, and IEC equipment design. Let's take a look at the first one. This is by far the most simple. And what we're gonna see is that it's simply gonna tell us straight out where this equipment can be located. So here's some examples where it shows that it's good for class one, two, and three. You can also see the gas groupings. Here's one with a uh, thread on cap. This is explosion proof and dust ignition proof. And it says class one, class two, and class three. It lists all the different gas and dust groupings. And finally, same with this one. I believe this is a motor. Haslock equipment markings can also be shown with a form of the newer style IEC, and that's called the Equipment Protection Level, or EPL for short. These are two letter codes, uppercase, lowercase, and there are six of them. On a piece of equipment, it would look like this. Now, these are fairly vague in the amount of information that they provide to us as an, an electrician or installer. If we look at special terminology, all of the EPLs are listed, and there's a short discussion as to what an EPL stands for, but realistically, it provides almost no information for us. If we go to table B185 in Appendix B, a version of a table similar to this one is shown. EPLs provide us with almost no detail on how the protection is provided, but they indicate to an electrician which zone they could be installed. So it's almost like a Coles notes for where can this be provided? Just tell me and don't give me any other ad additional information that's not of use. On the far other side is the IEC equipment design marking, which provides all of the information to us about the method of protection and all of the characteristics of the equipment. An example would be this one here. Now, when we see the letters EX, IA, 2C, and T6, these are codes that are provided in a specific order and they indicate specific things. We already know from previous presentations that 2C indicates the dust or the gas grouping. We know from earlier in this presentation that IA indicates the method of protection. 
we then have these two on the outer sides that we need to address. EX simply means the equipment is rated for hazardous location use. It does not mean it's explosion proof. IA is our method of protection. This one happens to be intrinsically safe. 2C indicates the gas grouping. And T6 is the temperature code. This order of codes and the breakdown of them is also shown in Appendix B, 18052, where they provide detail on each one of these four codes. Haslock mark markings indicate which zone the equipment can be installed in. Table 18 provides a detailed breakdown of every equipment marking that we have just looked at for each zone. And here's a brief look at Table 18, and we can see all of the information regarding the IEC markings, the EPL markings, and also when you're there, you will see the division classification markings for equipment that's explosion proof. Temperature is extremely important when we're discussing hazardous locations. In gas environments especially, maximum surface temperature ratings of equipment cannot be allowed to exceed the minimum ignition temperature of the surrounding hazardous location. And that's because, well, it could explode. If there's no maximum surface temperature rating listed, then the assumed temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. Now remember, the temperature code is located here. It's an uppercase T with a numeric number. When we go to Appendix B, we can then cross-reference that number, alphanumeric, code with table B184. Each temperature code has its own temperature listed, and this is the absolute maximum surface temperature that the equipment is designed to ever reach. This can be included on everything from control stations, which are just push buttons, to lamps, to motors or transformers. Here's an example of a hazardous location explosion-proof light. It has one, two, three, four different temperature ratings, which are based on the lamp that's installed. This is a Haslock push button light, and it has a temperature code of T6. Now, obviously, according to 18054, the basic logic is that the surface temperature cannot exceed the auto ignition temperature of the gas atmosphere. In this situation with a 300 watt light bulb in there of PS25 lamp, this will reach 200 degrees centigrade. And with a settle high gas atmosphere, that's 155 degrees centigrade auto ignition temperature. Well, as soon as you turn on the light and the fixture heats up, we will get ignition and explosion, and that's not good. Instead, something like this would be totally suitable because the temperature is far below the auto ignition temperature. Let's take a look at a couple of examples that combine surface temperature with the type of gas atmosphere present. The first one is a Haslock control station. Is this one permitted to be used in a hydrogen gas atmosphere? Its marking is EXMA 2C T6. Well, first thing we need to know is, well, hydrogen is going to be a 2C gas, and let's go to Appendix B in that chart or that table and find out what the auto ignition temperature is. So we flip to table B, 18.3, and the auto ignition temperature given for hydrogen is 560 degrees centigrade. We then go to Appendix B temperature code table and we look up T6. T6 indicates 85 degrees centigrade. Well, looks like the surface temperature does not exceed the auto ignition temperature. And due to that, this is totally acceptable. We could use this equipment in a hydrogen atmosphere. What about the second example? This is a Haslock transformer. It's permitted, is it permitted to be used in a gasoline atmosphere? So we have EXO 2A T2. Well, the first thing we need to do is take that gasoline and it's a 2A gas. Let's go to appendix B and that table B183 and see what the auto ignition temperature is. We look up gasoline and it looks like 280 degrees centigrade. Now we need to look up T2, which I have marked incorrectly. Hold on two seconds here. 
that looks better, T2. And we go to the temperature chart in Appendix B and T2 indicates 300 degrees centigrade. We bring that back and now we evaluate the two. Looks like the maximum surface temperature will be hotter than the auto ignition temperature of gasoline. And that means it would cause an explosion. So we can't install this, that wouldn't make any sense. The equipment would cause an explosion. Can the Hasluck electrical equipment enclosure that we're choosing to use withstand water, rain, or snow? Well, we need to go back to some of our original types of ratings we would have learned about in previous years of technical training. There are two different ways that we can classify equipment for its use in dry, wet, or submerged types of locations. There is a North American, which would be a type or NEMA rating. Example would be something like NEMA 4X, or an IEC, IP rating. Example is IP65. On this piece of equipment, we have both ratings available. And this will give us information as to how good this is at preventing dust or water from getting into the enclosure. Let's take a look first at the NEMA rating. In North America, most equipment is rated with a NEMA rating or a type rating. In Canada, 2400 and table 65 are used to determine what this particular marking indicates for its exposure or ability to prevent the ingress of water or dust or falling dirt or any sort of stuff. The IEC method is something called ingress protection. Now there is a nice clean table in Appendix B, B18.6, and this will provide you details on what the first number and the second number indicate. The first number is protection against contact and solid objects. The second number indicates the protection against liquids. This particular enclosure is IP66, and much like almost anything that was developed outside of North America and not Imperial, this makes a heck of a lot more sense. EP, IP66 says it's dust tight and strong jets of water are not able to get in. So all of these numbers can be in different forms, uh, depending on the type of enclosure that's used. The lowest protection enclosure would be an IP11 and the greatest uh, protection, protected enclosure would be an IP68. Finally, does everything electrical brought into a Haslock area require certification? I'm thinking, what about that thing? Or how about that thing? Would you be willing to bring those into a hazardous location where you have an explosive gas atmosphere? Something to consider because it's something that we often never take off our person. If we go to Appendix B, under rules 18050-18066, it indicates that yes, everything that's brought into a hazardous location must be rated for the particular gas that is involved. And they list all sorts of objects, some being quite old and some being a little bit newer, but you must be aware that even the sparking that could occur from a smartphone could ignite a hazardous atmosphere. Food for thought.